All right, well, good morning again, everybody. Morning. Morning. We're, uh, I don't know if, in a sense, you know, uh, we're going to go to war today. Uh, a warrior's call to arms, living for the king, is, is kind of some of the thoughts that were going through my mind over the past few weeks studying this message. And uh, a, uh, a warrior's call to arms. You know, most people in the world who don't really know the Lord, sometimes they think of Christians as being uh, weak, weak people. And, uh, and you know, Christians, you know, as a general rule, we're, we're no stronger or weaker than, than anybody else in and of ourselves. But in Christ, we are warriors, right? When we're walking with the Lord and when we're, we're growing in grace and knowledge and we're, we're, uh, we're striving, you know, to become who He wants us to be, I think every day we're a warrior. And, and, we're, and we have a call to arms, you know, the... The trumpet call to formation, and, and we want to live for the king. At least that's my take on it. I want to live for the king. I want to. I want to have my life count. And as we look into the Bible's messages, uh, you know, we've been in Numbers, and, and we're 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 kind of transitioning here, uh, definitely to the book of Matthew. Uh, we've been in Matthew uh, on and off over a couple of years, looking at some stuff. But, but I want you to keep in mind that the Bible's message is not a disjointed message. It may seem that way at times, but the Bible's message is, is, a, is really a unified, consistent message. This main subject being Christ, right? I mean, from, from the promise of the Savior in Genesis 3.15, well, from the first couple verses that God created the heavens and the earth. And, and, and then you go to John, and John tells us Jesus is the creator uh, go to Revelation, he's the Alpha and Omega, and everywhere in between, it, it's the story of Christ. So they're not disjointed, incongruent stories that have no bearing on each other. So as we go to Matthew, I want you to kind of still be thinking a little bit about what we talked about with, with all the grumbling that was going on in the wilderness and God's love and mercy and, and grace. But the stories of the Bible, um, sometimes we tend to separate them. And we want to compartmentalize them, just like we do our lives, right? Oh, this part of my life is for this, and this part's that. Oh, yeah, and here's the part of my life that's, that's good to go to church two hours a week, or one hour, okay? But, you know, when you compartmentalize your life, when you compartmentalize your faith, when, when you're not consistent in who you are, that makes for a frustrating life, doesn't it? I mean, all of us have been young at one time some of us are still young but when when, when I think back and and, uh, and and say even just high school junior high or high school you know around one group of people you were one way and around another group of people you could be another way right you know when you're with when, when you're at football practice you were one of the jocks when you're in the machine shop you were one of the machine heads right when you were hanging out in uh, the area outside the gymnasium called Teenage Wasteland, you might have been a partier, right? A freak or something. But in Christianity, God wants us to be consistent. And, uh, and the challenge that the Jews face in the wilderness are some of the same challenges that the Israelites, the Jews, faced in the first century and the same we have today. You know, God doesn't change. His word, the Bible says, is subtle in heaven. And so what he expects out of his people is really the same thing from, from generation to generation. I think in our last message, we were challenged to make good choices and to repent when we did not make the right choice. You know, the, again, that's what the Israelites learned over and over in the wilderness. And, and I know I've learned that over and over in my life. When I don't make the right choice, I have to repent and get right. Okay, and I think sometimes what people take for repentance is just saying, "Oh, I'm sorry," and what what they usually mean, and what I've meant at times is, "I'm sorry I got caught." Right? That's not that's not biblical repentance, right? Just being sorry you got caught. Okay, it, you know, being sorry is like what we hear today from a lot of public. Uh, 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 public personalities, whether they're politicians, sports figures, 
authors or whatever, you know, they they get busted doing some terrible things that they've railed against and, and uh, they, they come out with this weak, mealy mouth apology. Oh, I'm sorry if I offended someone. I'm sorry if you misunderstood my actions, right? That's not really genuine. That's not biblical repentance. Uh, they get socially shamed and they feel like they got to make some kind of apology and then weeks later they're at it again. But we're going to look at the into the book of Matthew chapters 3 through 7 for a while. And we're going to see here that that that, that Jesus and his forerunner John the Baptist when they talked about repenting, they meant something else than being sorry that you got caught, right? They expected something else. The Sermon on the Mount is, is and we're not going to get into the Sermon on the Mount today, but it, it's, we'll, we'll be there in a few weeks. And, it, and it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's one of the great discourses in, in the Bible and in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew has at least three great discourses. Two of them we've already looked at, okay? Chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom. We looked at age. We looked at that a while ago. Um, Matthew 24 and 25, signs of the times, end of the age. We looked at that last year, right? Does that ring a little bell? I hope it does. Today we're going to kind of go back and, and, and start with great discourse number one. Now, many uh, commentators think that the Sermon on the Mount was not necessarily something Jesus uttered beginning of his ministry. You know, Matthew places it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He places it here early on, but um, it was probably uh, maybe later in his ministry. And it was probably just like a good sermon, something that Jesus shared with more than one group of people. But primarily, you know, he brought his disciples to him, and then the multitudes came. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure Jesus was like most of us today. If you have a good message, you want to share it with different groups of people. Okay? But we have here in the Sermon on, on, on the Mount, it's a great message, but you've got to keep in mind, it's not an evangelistic message, okay? There's not an altar call, per se, in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? And it's not really the ethics of Christian life and, and living. I mean, it's got a lot of teaching, and it tells us a whole bunch of how we're to live. But it's not like a, a true ethical discourse um, for the church age. Because if you think about it, the church, in the book of Matthew, like all Gospels, the church is not on the scene yet, right? A lot of people want to take all their church doctrine from the, new, from, from the Gospels. But, um, the church was not in existence when the Gospels were being lived out. It came after uh, in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, okay? And I'm not saying we don't glean good doctrine and teaching and living out of, out of, out of the Gospels. We certainly do. But people get confused uh, when they see some things in the Gospels. And they're wondering, like, well, how come we're not doing it exactly like that in the church? Okay. But here we have the ministry of the king is starting. And who's the king? Who's Jesus. the king? Jesus. Jesus is the king. The ministry of the king is starting. And we know that his greatest antagonists were, were the scribes and Pharisees, right? He had some choice words for them. And we're going to read some about what is... Uh, what his cousin and good friend John the Baptist had to say about scribes and Pharisees. Again, this message is to the disciples and then people, and it was corrective to erroneous interpretations and application uh, uh, on the law. The Sermon on the Mount points to the reader to what life should be lived like in the kingdom. Like, if you're going to be a child of the king, this is how you should live. Okay? And Jesus desires that for us, I believe. It points to an eschatological, in other words, a future kingdom. Jesus is kind of like priming the listeners for what life's going to be like when the king really does rule. Of course, right now the king is just making his, getting ready to make his presentation to the world. Okay? But there's great requirements and expectations. Uh, 
Aren't you glad, though, you can get saved by faith just by trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross and that our performance doesn't uh, isn't have to be perfect to get into heaven because Jesus was. So we get to uh, uh, piggyback off of him, right, through faith. And that's a good thing. Just as Jehovah wanted the Jews in the Exodus to live like children of the king, Jesus desires the same to us. Um, and I think one thing I, I hope over the weeks to come we'll all be impressed with, uh, Christianity is not just getting your ticket punched to heaven. I mean, that's the big value of it, but it's way more than that, okay? Because sometimes when you see somebody, they, they, uh, they think they got their ticket punched to heaven, but they want to live like hell. It makes me worry for them because it's like they're standing on uh, cracked ice, you know, going out ice fishing on about a half inch of ice, and it's 45 degrees out, you know. It's, it's maybe not the best thing to do. You know, you, you might regret it a little bit later on. So, if you would, let's open up our books, our Bibles, and turn to Matthew chapter 3. The King's Herald. That's what we're going to read about. And a herald is someone who is making some kind of announcement or, or public proclamation about the king, right? Think about heralds of old. So before we start, let's let's uh, let's just have a word of prayer. But Father God, we come before you and we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the time we have to look into your word. Father, I pray that we would uh, take time out in the days and weeks ahead to read the book of Matthew uh, as part of our daily reading and, uh, and to be open uh, to what the Spirit has to say to us and uh, how we're living uh, our lives in service to the King, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, chapter 3 is very interesting. And again, I'm, I always pray, Lord, if I misspeak, strike it from your memory, the people's memory, before we leave. Because I don't want to misrepresent God's Word or say something erroneous. But in chapter 3, we have a strange man with a strange message. You ever heard John the Baptist described like that? Strange? I bet we have. Different words. Or so the culture, and so the people felt at that time, right? John looked, acted, ate, and drank. In fact, he lived just a little bit differently than, than most people in the time when, what, what, when she lived. You know, and, and he was a religious man. He was a God-fearing man. And of course, the Jews were used to a lot of religious, God-fearing men walking around, right? They were scribes and Pharisees. They had long robes with phylacteries on them. They had uh, epaulets. They had hats, maybe had scriptures on them. They had a different way of looking and living. And of course, John the Baptist, we're going to read, he had a little different way of looking and living also. He didn't act like all the rest of them. He didn't hang out with the in crowd. He was not the most popular person. He was not, and, and to use a, a term that uh, has become so popular, and he was not in the woke crowd where he called good, evil, and evil, <coughs> good. Okay? And, and apart from Jesus Christ, he was the last Old Testament prophet. You know, people don't usually consciously think, but when we're reading the Gospels, we're reading events that occurred in the Old Testament, okay? And John is a Old Testament prophet, uh, bar, you know, excellent. And these were days of religious and political upheaval. We could say the same thing about us, right? Mm -hmm. Slavery was big in the Roman Empire, and slavery 
is big in the world today. Many countries uh, in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, behind what used to be uh, the Iron Wall of Communism, whether in, in, in Eurasia or uh, South America, slavery is big with the drug cartels and so on. Slavery, slavery, conquest, drought, famine. It sounds like today, doesn't it? You know, the world back then, the religious world back then was like Cajun jambalaya. Anybody ever have jambalaya? It's a popular rice, meat, and vegetable dish enjoyed in the southeastern United States. It's, a, it's inexpensive. It's delicious. You can just throw it together any old way you want, okay? Whatever the chef has on hand, you can throw it into the pot and make some jambalaya. That's how some people live their life. That's how some people view religion. Whatever you got on hand, you throw it in the pot. And there's two kinds, Creole and Cajun. It depends on your use of tomatoes, okay, which is which. Um, and sometimes it varies in the order in which you put the ingredients together and how you cook them. Creole jambalaya is red jambalaya. It includes tomatoes, okay? And it has the holy trinity of vegetables, onion, celery, and bell pepper, and then meat being cooked together. Cajun jambalaya does not include tomatoes, okay? And it has a brown color. But it's found in most areas of, of, of uh, rural Louisiana, okay? And it's popular, and, and it's quite tasty. The religious world of, of uh, the Roman Empire was like jambalaya. You could throw it all together. Syncretism is maybe an official term. And anything would almost go. And even the Jews weren't exempt for that because they have different sects within their Judaism. And, and some of them were more strict. Some of them were more mystical. You know, the Sadducees didn't believe in angels or miracles or the resurrection. The Pharisees were meticulous law keepers and like to add. But things were messed up. And approaching religion with a jambalaya theology, like almost anything goes, messed up the world of John the Baptist. And it messes our world up today. That's why we need to rightly divide the word. Okay? And, and John the Baptist, when he came, he had a pretty simple recipe for religion. And we're going to read about that. He was not a theologian in the pharisaical sense, okay? He hadn't been to rabbi school. He wasn't a, ra a philosopher wrestling with the nuances of, of what really constitutes work on the Sabbath. You know, if you pour out your drink that you didn't drink on the, and, and, and you pour it into a pot plant, you know, a, a hole in like some vegetables or something, are you watering? Are you doing work by watering? Some of the, the religious leaders would say you are watering by pouring out your water into the plant. I find that silly. I think most of you do by the looks on your faces. But he wasn't a philosopher mulling over nuances of the, of the latest humanistic fads and teaching and living. He was not a cultic leader demanding worship, okay, that you have to bow down to me. And John the Baptist, except for his uh, opinion of Jesus, he was not a respecter of persons. I think that's fair to say that. So if you would, let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, is what he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt about round his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, <coughs> who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. 
For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear a good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And as for me, John told him, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you do come to me. But Jesus answering him said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Repent, John said. Repent. Do you ever have somebody tell you to repent? I have. I've had people tell me, and I've certainly had the Spirit of God tell me to repent and to change my ways. John is saying to the people and to the religious, the king is here. Repent. Now, he didn't say king here, but, you know, that's, that's what played out here. When royalty comes to dinner, what do you do? I've never had royalty, but when somebody special comes over, maybe it's your in-laws for the first time, what do you do? You want the place looking sharp, right? When grandma and grandpa come, right, you want looking good. But when you know company's coming, you just don't want to leave mud on the floor, right? And some leftover uh, oatmeal on the table and just tell them scrape that off. You want it cleaned up. You might even get dressed and take a shower, huh, Oak? <laughs> when company comes. <laughs> but when royalty comes, you want to spruce things up. Now, John the Baptist shows up, and for about a thousand years, roughly, the Jews have been playing, uh, playing patty cake with God. They've been testing him in the wilderness. They've been testing him as the kingdom divided. Even as the Assyrians rolled across the northern kingdoms, and the Babylonians exiled Judah and the southern kingdom, and the folks come back, you know, they've been playing games and testing God. And they had, they, they, had, they had ignored the message of repentance, of getting right with God. And that's why they were in, in such bad shape. And now Rome, the despised Roman Empire, was ruling the land. This word repent is a powerful word if applied properly. It is everything in order for us today, Christian, to live a God-honoring life. If we don't grasp this idea of repentance then we are never going to be all we can be for Jesus and be the person he wants us to be. You know, that if you want to live a powerful life for the Lord, you better learn how to repent. Because I can tell you what, none of us are perfect. Amen? Amen. None of us have the market cornered on anything when it comes to this faith. But we're learning, right? We're working on our salvation with fear and trembling. As Paul says, this word repent has a time element to it. It has a change element to it. It's something that has to do with our will. we got to consciously make a decision. It doesn't happen by accident. It means to think differently, to act differently, to live differently in a continuous way, okay? You know, repent, to repent is not a, a one-time-fits-all, one, one solves it all. You've often heard me say it's the second greatest gift we get from God next to salvation. We have to use our will to agree with God about some necessary changes that need to take place. It has to do with our thoughts because our thoughts have to be right with God before our actions follow through, right? You can think anything you want, but the proof is in the pudding. How, is, how do you act? But if you change the mind, you can change the life. You can change the acts. You can change the behavior. And again, it's not being godly. It's not being sorrow. Godly sorrow, the Bible says, leads to repentance. 
And you can just listen while I turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. I'm going to read that verse. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, because if there, if there was a church that needed to repent of some things, the church in Corinth was it. Paul, in his uh, exhortations to the Corinthians, you know, he's talking to them about being separated from evil. And, and he wanted them to know that when they repented of some of their bad behavior, bad deeds, bad thinking, bad teaching, bad living, that he would be joyful over that. But, and did I, I, I think I turned to the wrong, I got 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 10, here we go. Verse 9, Paul says, I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. That's a big difference, don't you think? I think it is. <coughs> what we read here back in Matthew 3 with John the Baptist, it was kind of like a shock and awe message to the people and to the religious leaders. You know, a shock and awe, I always think, I go back to the, the first Gulf War where they started using that term, shock and awe, where it was amazing what the ground troops and what the Air Force did in, in Iraq, wasn't it? It was, it, it had to be shock and awe, especially to the people there. It was amazing to watch it on TV. I mean, the first, I think it was the first war we got to see live action on TV quite like that. I mean, at the same time. And that's what this message was. John showing up, dressed with camel skin, leather belt. I don't know if he had any locusts in his beard or not, bits of locusts, you know, of how cleaned up he got. But I picture John being kind of wild looking, you know. He said, the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven I love that term, but I don't always understand it. At least I haven't in the past. I don't, and I don't know about you. When you hear the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, are you sometimes confused? Is it sometimes you kind of wrestle with it, wonder what's going on here? But he said the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's getting ready to show up. And of course, it wasn't long before Christ showed up. But the kingdom of heaven, the origin of that kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, okay? It's, it's not out of conquest by a man's army. It's not something that's bought. But its origin is heavenly, its end is heavenly. Its king, its character, its people. The destiny of its subjects is different than the kingdoms of the world. The laws are different, the institutions are different. But you know what's good? The privileges of its citizens are different and so much better than any kingdom of the world. And they're heavenly focused and based. And you know, I love it because there's no national or ethnic limitations in the kingdom of heaven. You know, people are always all upset over racism, and racism is terrible, right? You know, and, and, and ethnic division and clashing. Most of the wars in the world come over, you know, you look different than me, you think different, you talk different, so we're going to clash, right? In the kingdom of heaven, that's not the case. And, we, and you know, you only need one passport to get into that, that kingdom and to move about freely in that kingdom. You know what the passport is? And you can't counterfeit it like, like a COVID uh, vaccine passport. Although there are counterfeits out there, but, they're, but they won't be there in the kingdom in the future. Because the passport is faith in Jesus Christ, right? Your passport for this kingdom, in essence, is, is, is written not with invisible ink or purple ink. It's red ink, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. But it's faith in Christ is what you need to cross the border. And you know what? There's no waiting line, right? 
You get the cross instantaneously when you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. So John says, repent. And then he, ta he quotes Isaiah. He say, hey, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and I'm telling you, get ready, be, make ready for the way of the Lord because he's coming. The king is coming. You don't know when he's showing up, but he's coming. And it says, Jerusalem, Judea, all the district around the Jordan, you know, people from the city, people from the country, rich people, poor people, religious people, irreligious people, everybody was coming. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Now, this wasn't a baptism for salvation, but it was a repentance. Like, I got to get right. This baptism, is, it's, baptizo is the Greek word, it's identification. They were identifying in John, with John's message that we're sinners and we got to get right with God. You think about it, Jesus identifies with us. Is he fully human? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did he undergo a physical birth? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Did he cry? Yes. Did he bleed? Yes. Did he weep over death and the pain and anguish that life brought to his friends? Yes. He identified with us in so many ways. In his birth, in his living, in his emotions, and in his death, in his tears. And John says, you want me to baptize you? And I'm jumping ahead here a little bit. We're going to kind of cycle back through this chapter here a little bit. But Jesus said, permit it or suffer at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? There is one baptism, though, that, that a Christian needs. And if you don't have this baptism, you're not a Christian. And it has nothing to do with water. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Paul here again with some teaching to the Corinthian church. And I'll start reading here with, with verse 12. And of course, this is uh, this section of scripture more has to do with the purpose of gifts and talks about unity and diversity, okay, amongst other things. But Paul says, even as the body is one and yet has many members, talking about our physical body, you know, we have fingers, we have toes, we got eyes, we got hair, right? We got knees, we got legs, we got elbows. I think everybody's got an elbow. Do you got an elbow, Madison? Yeah. You got two of them? Yeah. Okay. So she's got a, she's got a good functioning body. And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also is Christ. So now he's talking about something different here. So also is Christ. He's being in the church. For by one spirit, we, this is the members of the church, were all baptized in one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Okay? He says we're baptized into one body by the spirit. That baptism has to be with, with the, of the indwelling of the Spirit of, of God when a person steps over that threshold of unbelief into belief and receives Christ as Savior. That is the baptism that, that we need. And I'm not saying physical baptism isn't important because it certainly is. Jesus, I think, commands us to do it. It's an act of obedience. But Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit at conversion. And, G and John the Baptist is wanting the people to be identified with Christ. He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. This was, in a sense, a, a, a partial fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. What, what we're talking about, what we looked at here, Isaiah 53, 12. It says, therefore, I, I, I think I got the right verse. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. 
In Isaiah 53, 12, in this great passage on the suffering servant, we're seeing Jesus' identification with us. He identified us. He was numbered with the transgressors. Okay? He bore our sins, and he interceded for us. He identified completely with us by taking our sins. And we need to identify with him. And as we look here at the end, too, we also see this picture of a dove, the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on Jesus after he, after he came up out of the water. Now, did Jesus have to be baptized to have his sins forgiven? No. He had no sin. So why did he do it? And I know I'm being redundant, but to identify with us is so important. In effect, Jesus, when he was baptized, he's saying, I always do the will of my Father, which we read that in other scriptures, okay? I always do the will of my Father's. But this dove, what kind of an offering was a dove in the Old Testament law? It was a poor man's offering, right? Two turtle doves, or, or a single dove. It was a poor man's sin offering. And we never see anywhere else where the Holy Spirit takes on the, the shape and appearance of a dove. That's interesting, isn't it? A dove is a gentle bird, isn't it? A dove is a, a weak bird. It doesn't have talons. You'll never see a, 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 a dove dropping out of the sky to attack a yearling deer to try and kill it for a meal like a friend of mine saw a golden eagle do the other day. That's not how a dove operates. A, a dove is peaceful. A, a dove is about community, right? I mean, you always see lots of doves. John the Baptist saw this and Jesus did. Being baptized, Jesus is in effect saying, I'll do it. I will do the will of my fathers and go to the cross. And the Spirit coming to him is empowerment and crowning of the king. Not that he needed that, but that John could see it in empowerment for his ministry and we could learn from it as Matthew documents it and help us realize that, you know what, God has got a plan. God is doing things and it doesn't go the way of the world, okay? A warrior's call to arms for Christ means we go to war in a different way than physical, physical war. And then we have the voice. Wouldn't you love to hear God's voice saying, this is my daughter. Joyce, I am so pleased with you. Wouldn't you love to hear that come out of the heavens? Or God say, Ken, you love your wife so much, you do all this stuff for her, and you are so kind to her. You're my man. Wouldn't you love to hear that? But you know what? One day you are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, if we live for the king. You know? The kingdom of heaven's at hand. And John the Baptist was trying to tell the people to get prepared. He was planting seeds. And he was telling a, a strong message. You know, sometimes we have to tell people that they're, you know, the Bible says this, you're not doing things quite right. And you need to repent. You need to get right. You know, the religious leaders, they went there, they didn't have the right attitude. And I think John knew they didn't have the right attitude because he calls them a brood of vipers. <laughs> now, if you're gonna, if, you know, there's there's a point in time to use gentle and kind words with people, and there's a point in time to get tough. You might say, right? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Sometimes we gotta speak strong medicine and words to people. Other times we gotta be gentle. Okay. But God didn't need those religious leaders. John told them, we have Abraham. Don't say we got Abraham's, because he says God can raise up stones to be Abraham's children. In other words, God's a miracle worker. God doesn't need you, but you need him. That's part of what this message was, and that's what we got to remember. God doesn't need me. He can get along just fine without Dave Carroll. He, he's done it 
for an eternity past. But praise God, he's stuck with me for eternity future because I'm one of his kids. You know? John tells him, if you're going to play religious games and you're going to be hypocritical... And you're just going to always think about what's in it for you. In other words, what God wants to do. The axe is at the root of the trees. Now, when you think of an axe being laid at the root of the trees, what do you think of? It's going to be cut down. Something's going to be cut down. That's, that's a picture of judgment. In other words, your time is limited, tree, because you're going into the burn pile. Right? Or you find, Maybe for us, an axe isn't so appropriate, but how, to chain, how about that? A chainsaw. An eye-linked still chainsaw is sitting by the stump. That tree's quivering a little bit, thinking like, oh man, I hope you get my buddy. No, I don't know if it is or not. But John was preaching repentance, but he was preaching judgment. Because good fruit is essential. Positive, productive, God-honoring living is important. Think about what we've covered in the book of Numbers. A lot of the fruit of the people's lives wasn't good, right? That's why God got after them. But God here, speaking through John the Baptist, is trying to get people to realize that Jesus is coming. He's going to show up. And one day he's going to show up right he's, he's gonna i mean he's gonna show up and rapture his church out i believe but one day he's gonna show up at the end of the tribulation period and every eye will see and the, and the prophecy of zechariah will be fulfilled when he comes to the mount of olives and lights upon it and the mountains will split and there's going to be tremendous judgment on the brood of vipers that are alive at that time John wanted the people to repent and get right. Just like any good gospel preacher, teacher, Christian today, we want people to get right with God. Kingdom people have to be different people. We got to be different from the world and from the culture. And it's a, it's a hard thing, isn't it? Sometimes I don't act like Pastor Dave. I act like somebody else. And I got to repent. You know, beloved, you cannot be a disciple of Christ and live exactly as you did before. God will judge. He, he, he has judged me for sin in my life, and he'll judge you for sin in your life and bringing shame on his son. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. Psalms and then Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. It says, For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. So kids, teenagers, when your parents correct you, it's not that they don't delight in you. They correct you because they love you. I was told that, and I, as a parent, I've said that, and as a grandparent, I've said that to my grandkids. God loves us enough that he'll reprove us in order to help us repent. And if you don't like a proverb, go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews 12, 6. This is a, a, a verse that uh, my friend Ed Esweiler has used a lot in counseling people. It says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. That's put a little stronger. He scourges those. And that's quoting from Proverbs 3.12, what we just looked at. But also, I think maybe Psalm 119.75 fits in there. But Revelation 3.9 would be the last one. And there's more we could look at. But Revelation 3.9, 3.19, excuse me. This is the message to Laodicea. 
Jesus here says, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And there's many other verses in the Bible you can read about that. So John's message is a message that resonated with those who had ears to hear back in the day. And I think it will resonate with, with those who have ears to hear today. We are to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you're not seeing any fr fruit in your life, maybe you aren't, God isn't seeing any repentance. John had a shock and awe message for the day, and also ministry, and Jesus did too. So what kind of message or ministry does our life project? Sometimes maybe there should be a little shock and awe that people are amazed that, hey, what are you doing? And I mean this in a good way, you know, when you're really standing for the Lord and they see, wow, you know, I've never seen this out of you before. And we can learn a lot from John the Baptist and how to influence our world, can't we? We also learn from, from what little bit we looked at here today, and I think Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is going to continue on with this theme and a thought, is that conformity to culture and its sin is never the goal for God's people. Right? I don't care what dispensation we're talking about. And that's why the clarion call of the ages for God's kingdom people is repent. The status quo is not going to win you any trophies, right? If you just want a participation trophy in your Christian life, okay. But I find that a dangerous mindset for a Christian to have, especially in today's world. Christ died for our sins, so we'd be raised to new life. It's, and it's not just to get into heaven. I mean, that's one of the benefits, but he wants us to have new life. He wants a, our life to be a kingdom life. And people needed to hear John's message. They need to hear Jesus' message, and we are the heralds. You know, Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ, right? He wants to use us to accomplish some of his kingdom work down here. If you're wanting to be used of God, and if I want to be used of God, I need to repent of a few things. And you do too. You know why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. The king came once and he's coming again, right? And many of us would say, and we've talked amongst ourselves, we say, you know, things are so crazy. So how many times have you heard somebody say, I think the Lord's coming back real soon, right? Well, the message to precede the return of the king is repent. Repent. Let's get busy about doing some kingdom work. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for the power of your word, for the examples that you leave for us, Lord. Thank you most of all for indwelling your children with your spirit so that uh, we don't have to look for a, a dove, the spirit to come visibly in the form of a dove on us, but that he is residing in our hearts and our minds, uh, permeating every fiber of our being, Lord, and every thought we have. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit as he works to get us to repent in whatever way, shape, or form, or area of life we need to. I thank you so much, Lord, that you look down on this whole sinful world and you've given us all we need for true wealth and prosperity. And that comes through having a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you will bless the people. Uh, for hearing and responding to your word today and always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, and you are dismissed.